This is Evolutionary Radio. This is your host, Trevor Kuritsen. Steve, we got a really interesting guest today. Yeah, today we have an acupuncturist. We haven't had too many of them that, that have come on. So Trevor, um, please introduce our guest. This is an acupuncturist who I've recently been seeing, and I've been noticing a huge improvement, so I reached out to her and wanted to see if she would come on the show. So joining us today is Rebecca Sprintz from Family Acupuncture Wellness Clinic in Winnipeg. Hello. Okay, so Rebecca, first off, most of our listeners have probably never heard of you before. So what I want you to do is give us a bit about your background. Why did this cute little white girl into <laughs> Chinese medicine? Like, like how, did, how did that all start? Long story. But uh, the main thing that really got me was randomly in university, I just started getting awful digestion. And I went through the whole medical system, went through tests for years. They made me eat radioactive eggs, sent me to a psychiatrist thinking I was secretly having an eating disorder. And after a couple of years of testing, they told me that there was nothing they could do and my future was cancer. And so at that moment, I started seeing the limitations of Western medicine and I wanted to seek out a medicine that really has highlights where our medicine kind of falls short. So I started discovering Chinese medicine and I'm kind of an eager person. So instead of just learning about it, I decided to apply for my doctorate in Chinese medicine and truly learn about it. And so I packed up, moved across the country and I went to Chinese medicine school, which was like a four year degree. And in my very first year as a student, I diagnosed and treated myself and it's a non-issue. So can you micromanage the difference between Western medicine and holistic medicine? Western medicine is, seems to be in your situation, tests, drugs, you know, it, or tests, diagnosis based on the test, then throw a drug at the problem, see if that works, then come back again, then throw another drug at the problem, see if that works. It's an ongoing thing. What separates that from what you do? Well, I think from my experience, at least with Western medicine, they're kind of going to assume you have a problem till proven otherwise. So they would label with me with a certain diagnosis, try meds. If that med doesn't work, then I don't have that diagnosis. Then they move on. Whereas Eastern medicine, we give the body the benefit of the doubt that it's healthy, but it just kind of moved a little bit off beat. So we kind of direct it back in the right direction. So we assume everybody's healthy. There's just a little bump in the road. So once we start addressing that ailment, then the body gets healthier again. So we view the body as a whole as opposed to just isolated symptoms. So instead of looking just at my digestion problem, I looked at my whole system because the digestion could have just been a symptom of a bigger cause, which it was. So once I actually created the cause, then I started healing. Talk to us a little bit about acupuncture. Like what exactly is acupuncture? Because I feel like there's a lot of confusion on what exactly it is. Oh, well, that's a loaded question. So acupuncture is a branch of traditional Chinese medicine. So traditional Chinese medicine is acupuncture, herbs, moxibustion, and diet. But acupuncture specifically is inserting little fine needles into the body to start eliciting a healing response. And, and how does that work um, in, uh, you know, simple terms? in terms of, because people are thinking in their head, you know, you're gonna stick me with a freaking needle, you know, you're gonna stick me in, in, the, in the head with a needle and stuff. Like what is, what is going on when that happens to, oh, um, yeah. it's something with the chi, right? The QI, yeah. that's, a good, that's a good Scrabble word, by the way. QI. That's true, you can get some decent points for that. But uh, yeah, so the concept of acupuncture is pretty terrifying, but the reality is quite lovely. So all you do is put a couple pins in the body. They're so tiny. You could take about 10 acupuncture needles and put inside of a hypodermic one. Because it's not about injecting, it's just about stimulating. So they're a little bit thicker than a hair, a little bit smaller than a whisker. And then what you do is you just put them in certain points in the body based on where things are blocked or if things. So basically when it comes to ill health, it's either stagnated, something is stuck, it's really deficient, something is too weak, or it's really excess, something is too strong. So based on what's happening in the body, we can start reducing some of the extremes. We can help lift some of the weakness or we can start dispersing some of the blockages. So when it comes to pain, it's usually more blockage. So if you think about if you put like a foreign object in a body, what happens? 
you know, all this blood, the platelets, the white blood count, red blood count, whatever. It all goes there and says, get this thing out. And then once it's there, it's like, wait a minute, we've probably neglected this part of the body. Now that we're here, we see that this muscle is overstretched. Let's start repairing it. So it really brings to attention parts of the body that the body may have missed. So let's talk about who you feel would benefit the most from acupuncture. Because I think acupuncture, especially here in North America, is the last thing people would think about. You know, if someone was feeling stressed or something like that, they might say, oh, I need a vacation or like, I don't think, I don't think anyone's really thinking about acupuncture. Who, what are the types of individuals you think would benefit the most from it? Uh, oh, that's a loaded question. Just speaking to an acupuncture. So I think almost anyone could benefit from it. So if you're exercising with all that lactic acid buildup in there, acupuncture can help flush hormones or cortisol or stress on the body so there's a quicker recovery. If people are more athletes with injuries, it can reduce inflammation, help with lymphatic drainage, help the body repair quicker. So that's helpful. For people undergoing stress, well, that's, that's a given. It's, it relaxes people at like a cellular level and they don't realize how stressed they are until they start getting some relief. So for me, in my practice, I specialize in hormones. So I'll treat everyone from hypothyroidism to help manage blood sugars for diabetes to fertility, pregnancy, menopause, anxiety, insomnia, because so many factors are related to hormones. So to me, almost anyone can benefit from acupuncture. Do you deal with a lot of um, weightlifters ever? I deal with some weightlifters. Like with us, it seems to be, especially as you get older, we start getting nagging injuries. Mm -hmm. And is that attributable to hormones or is that attributable to wear and tear? And how, how would you treat someone like us? Because everyone listening to this lifts weights and we deal with injuries, especially as we get older. You know, uh, you know I'm in my, I'm almost 40. My body's like falling apart, you know? I've been lifting for over 20 years. So how can you help a, someone like me who's been lifting weights a long time? Do you think there's a hormone issue there or is it wear and tear? And how would you treat that? The pain, think, the injuries, you know? Well, I think it would be all the above. It's hormones, it's wear and tear, it's injuries that may not be resolved because when you weight lift, you push things, you're in this constant state of flight or fight. So your body is saying, I can't do any more. And your brain says, I got this, I will do more, and you achieve it. And that's why weightlifters can achieve greatness because there is this fascinating disconnect between what the body is telling you to do and what the brain is telling you to do. So in a sense, it's like you're always in this flight or fight adrenaline rush. So you get this amazing high, and then you go home, rest, recover, but your body is still in a big state of shock because it's, You've gone past the natural limitations of what the average person would do. So there is this underlying hormone rush that really keeps building up. So with acupuncture, we can really help let go of that fight or fight so other parts of your body can still balance, like digestion, which usually takes a big hit when you're in a constant state of fight or fight. So acupuncture can help with that overall wellness. Plus, of course, wear and tear. Your muscles are exhausted. And when you injure a body muscle memory is a fabulous fascinating thing it's annoying with injuries it's great for riding bikes but what happens is if you tore a muscle it's never quite the same you don't have that exact perfection recovery from it so there is that underlying vulnerability and with acupuncture you can help the body heal better so we can allow things to set in a better way so you don't have this ongoing vulnerability year after year exercise after exercise so it does help the body feel better. In I'm, addition, I'm, I'll, hmm? I'll tell our listeners a little bit about my first experience. So most of our listeners are probably similar to me, you know, weight trainers, type A personalities, very goal set, high strung, overachievers. So I knew that my sympathetic nervous system was always going. Like I'm always, what can I do? What's the next task? As weightlifters, you know, every time we go to the gym, we want to beast mode it, hit a new personal record, a new best. Most of us, if we're not crawling out of the gym, we feel like we failed, right? And I wanted something to activate my parasympathetic 
because as you know, you have your fight and flight, your sympathetic, and you have your parasympathetic, which is your rest and digest, which is when your body actually repairs or recovers, but nothing really worked. I tried meditation and things like that. It's just, it doesn't really work for me. And I find most science-based minds like myself, when they try to like do meditation or chanting, they're after like 10 seconds, like this is stupid, this isn't for me. So one of my friends reached out to me and said, you should try acupuncture. And I was very skeptical. And after my first, so basically Rebecca put in all the needles and after she put in the needles and turned off the light, I immediately fell asleep. It was the weirdest feeling. It was almost like I was drunk. Like, cause I wasn't tired. This is in the middle of the day. This was like two in the afternoon. And like, I had this like weird drunk feeling. And then after the appointment, the entire day I felt like exhausted, but it was like a different type of exhaustion. It wasn't, it, it wasn't like that feeling where like you feel overstrung. I just felt like I needed rest and I slept the longest I've ever slept. And that's because I really feel like that was the first time in a long time my parasympathetic has been activated. And then also, I think a lot of people who are going through digestive issues, it's the same thing. Because they're so high stress, because they're so high strung, their body's never actually digesting their food because it's constantly pumping out adrenaline, it's pump constantly pumping up cortisol, things like that. Rebecca, am I kind of on the right mindset here? And then Steve, you don't. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly it. So we always live in this life of stress that we don't know what it's like to have absence of it. So we're so driven. We, we're always in a rush to go somewhere. So that parasympathetic nervous system really is at an all-time low, especially with this generation. So after acupuncture, people feel literally drunk or under the influence of something. But realistically, what they're feeling is calmness. It's just so foreign to them. They don't know how to process it. And it's, it's beautiful. Do you want me to... Hmm? Do you want me to explain from Chinese medicine how we view that adrenal fatigue or that stress so it makes more Yes. Sense? No, no, you know. No, I'm kidding. Yes, please do it. I was going to say, though, and Sam's like, because Trevor always complains about insomnia, I also, he always Skypes me like at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? And now I know why. He just explained it. So for him, like, that's what he needed to kind of, like, get him relaxed because he's, he's always stressed. Yeah, that's what most of us need. And meditation is and meditation is fabulous, but it's different. It calms one component of our body. Where with acupuncture, it calms down every component of the body too. So you're not just mentally calm while meditating. You're going to be at a whole different level for a while until you keep repeating the same pattern over and over and you get back to your hyper stage. So say you're in that situation, what Trevor was describing, would it be best to do acupuncture like in the evenings, like at the latest appointment of the day? Yeah, my evenings are always packed for that reason, because this way you actually get to embrace it. So people love the zen stoned-like feeling. They go home, they have the best sleep of their life, if they can actually listen to their body and sleep. Where some people, if they're coming at lunchtime, you feel good, but you kind of have to suppress it because you still want to accomplish so much in the day. So you still get benefits, but you don't get that enjoyment from it. So, so people out there who want to book an appointment, ask for the latest appointment of the day. Oh, yeah. Friday evening, latest appointment possible, and you're kind of golden for the weekend. So it resets your work mentality, and it actually allows you to have a weekend. Interesting. Talk to us a little bit about adrenal fatigue. Oh, adrenal fatigue. That's a, that's a fun topic. Well, it's, it's a controversial topic because – so yeah, much controversy. Doctor on here, he would say that's a myth. Yes. So apparently, a chiropractor in the '90s created the terminology of adrenal fatigue. So with doctors, they will say this does not exist because we cannot test for it. Therefore, it's not valid. Therefore, this is the made-up syndrome. But adrenal fatigue is is kind of like the neat link between Chinese medicine and Western medicine because patients know it. They're walking, they're going to doctors, they're going for tests. The doctors say you're healthy, you're perfect. There's nothing wrong with you. It's in your mind. But the patient keeps coming back to that doctor saying something's not right. Fix me, find out the answer. And usually when you delve into it, it's adrenal fatigue. It's unresolved stress that the body starts feeling. So you're 
adrenals are basically these little things that sit over your kidneys and it helps with some hormones, particularly cortisol, which gets affected by stress. So it's uh, the symptoms that they might feel is basically unresolved stress symptoms. They might feel fatigue, their digestion's off, they start getting irritability, etc. So in Chinese medicine, we can classify it as adrenal fatigue, but we view things differently. So from a TCM perspective, what someone has is something that we call liver chi stagnation, which is interesting because the adrenal fatigue in a sense directs or affects the liver. But when we speak about liver, it's not your organ, it's this meridian system because all symptoms are basically interconnected with one another. So it's almost like an unresolved stress. So your liver meridian in Chinese medicine, this is, this is the drive meridian, not necessarily the sex drive, but the focus, the inspiration drive. So this is the meridian with goals, ambitions, and plans. And as long as life goes according to plan, the liver's really happy. But the biggest weakness in the liver meridian or adrenals is stress. Stress in Chinese medicine just means anything out of your control. It has nothing to do with physical stress, except for in regards to bodybuilders, because this is a whole different level of physical stress. Where like I was saying before, the body says we can't do more. The brain says, yeah, we totally can rock it. We've done it before. And then you push yourself into this extreme state of stress, which is like a flight or fight. But when I speak about stress, I mean more of that emotional component. So when stress comes into play, it kind of bumps people off like a perimeter highway. So they go into like rush hour traffic. So the chi, that energy, gets really stuck. It gets really stagnated. So when people are stressed, they get that tight neck and shoulders. They clench their jaw. When they get headaches, it could be anywhere around the base of their skull or anywhere around their eyes. Their hands and feet could be clammy or really cold. Their chest could be tight. They're just feeling stressed. So it's like that state of fight or fight, that state of rest and digest. So their mood starts changing. They get irritable. They get frustrated. They get anxious. And that's just that adrenaline, that cortisol, this unresolved hormone that is built and built and built, and it just kind of has to release. So before, before we move on, though, what you just mentioned seems to be like everyone I know, including me. Mm -hmm. So it's like if I came to you, like a lot of people are listening, it's like, wow, this sounds really cool. I want to try it. And I've done acupuncture, you know, a thousand times. But most of the people listening to this never even heard of it, never even did it. So if they were to, you know, go to acupuncture, how would you treat what you just described, for example? Well, you stick a bunch of needles in our neck? Like, what is, how would you do it? Well, when people walk in, you could kind of read people instantly. So when people have that chi stagnation, that adrenal fatigue, they're always in a rush. They're wanting to cut me off. If I talk too slow, they want to speed me up. It's like, get to the point. I want to do something. I'm focused. So we treat them on that physical way, but we're also kind of working on them a little bit in that emotional way. So you can read people right off the cusp. And for that chi stagnation, you can just see that jaw clench. You can see those temples kind of pound. You can feel their, their mood, their aggressiveness. It's kind of neat. So what we do is we basically do a couple points that really just flush cortisol. So instead of them being so guarded, it just really just releases that tension. So when people think about acupuncture, they think of porcupines. That is not the case whatsoever. Um, I would probably do five to seven points on them. Usually a point by their thumb, a point by their toe, a point here, and maybe a point over here. And it just, they're, once I give them treatments, dim them the lights, put some nice music on, they're just like mush. And it's, it's neat because they get to this state of relaxation that they've never actually had before. What do you mean? But I mean, they're going to go back to their normal, crazy lifestyle, two jobs, you know, and stress and, you know, I, you know, all that stuff. So don't they have to come back to you? And how often will they have to come back to actually see results over the intermediate term? So when you're treating a person for stress, you can't treat stress per se, but you can treat how the body deals with it. So there, it's almost like a person is an onion and you're just peeling those little layers because there's so much to stress, you know, is it their family stress? Is it their work stress? Is it their exercise stress, etc. So it's not like this aha moment that you're like, I am fixed and I never need a treatment again and I'm going to live in a happy bubble. It's more, it's the subtle changes where they go home and they don't lose their patience. 
you know, or they're able to go to sleep a little bit later without crashing. Or when they're in a work meeting, they're not getting as revved up. And they're going to start, they're not noticing how amazing they feel with acupuncture, but they notice the lack of symptoms because of acupuncture. So everything just gets a little bit happier. They get a little bit present. So instead of just going from task to task to task, where they're just getting through it like a zombie, they can actually kind of enjoy what they're doing. So they have to look back and be like, oh yeah, I was able to keep my cool in that situation, or I wasn't in a rush, or I didn't scream at five drivers this ride, I only scre I screamed at two drivers this ride. And so it just is this neat, subtle change until you actually become a better person. So Rebecca, most people in our society are using coffee on a daily basis to get through the day. <laughs> especially weightlifters are using pre-workouts, stimulant-based fat burners because they're very effective at cutting appetite. And then also most of them are using liver toxic things, things like anti-inflammatories, even liver toxic steroids. How prominent would you say adrenal fatigue is? Is this something the majority of our listeners would be experiencing? Yes. Most of them would be experiencing it, at least to some extent, because again, they all have their eye on the prize. So they're not necessarily feeling what they're feeling presently. They're already out of body looking at what their goal is like. So you could be having so many adrenal fatigue symptoms before you even have something that whatever you want to call adrenal fatigue is. So if you don't have that good rush for that workout, you want to build it, you want extra strength, you start taking supplements. Well, now your liver, your kidneys, everything is getting a little bit more vulnerable, but now you become dependent on these supplements. So the adrenal fatigue has already happened that you need this to perform at a certain level. Then you might need a little bit more to perform at this level. So it's almost like you're creating that situation that you don't want in the first place. You, you hear that over and over. I can't function without my daily cup of coffee. And it goes from one cup of coffee to two cups of coffee to three cups of coffee. And then soon you're adding in some monsters and Red Bulls. And then it's, it's a vicious cycle. So for our listeners, if they're using, you know, anti-inflammatories on a regular basis because their body's inflamed, if they're needing stimulants just to function, what would you suggest to get off those? How would you get off of them? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? It would be slow because I don't think any person who is just a confident bodybuilder wants to crash. I don't think anyone wants to deal with that detox of having a right off of a month just to start from ground one but realistically the body needs a break so some foods that are really helpful for liver is anything in like the sour category so grapefruit oranges lemons having things like that really help or having dark green leafy vegetables carrots broccoli that also strengthens up the liver so it can start detoxing some of those steroids and chemicals as well what about um you know, people who have the injuries, mm -hmm. um, you know, how would you treat that person? Because with the stress and stuff, adrenal fatigue, you're saying you'd only put five or six needles in them at the, you know, certain points in their hands, feet. But like with someone with an injury, let's say they have a nerve issue, like Lee Priest, I don't know if you know who he is. He's, uh, he's one of the top bodybuilders, but he actually has a crushed nerve. And it's preventing him from even feeling his arm anymore. Oh, well, that is where acupuncture really flourishes. So acupuncture in regards to treating nerves is one of the best modalities for it. Whereas other modalities to treat a nerve, you have to go from the outside in. So if you're getting massage, if you're getting worked in that way, you're almost creating more inflammation just to decrease inflammation. Where with acupuncture, you just get that pin right in there, right above the nerve, and it really heals the body from the inside out. So any bursitis, any carpal tunnel, any nerve issues, acupuncture really flourishes. So, so, so if they walked in with that issue, <clears throat> like what would you do to treat that? It would be just acu you, you hit the acupressure, the key, the points, whatever it's called, with the needle? Oh. Or is there something else that you would do to treat that? So if he walked in and I could tell that he still had underlying stress, frustration, etc., I have to release that guard. So I would still do probably those four points and the point over here to let that guard down because pain is an interesting thing. It's when the body experiences so much pain, particularly nerve pain, it gets terrified of that sensation. So what it does is all the muscles guard around that area to say, I don't want to feel any more pain. And it just kind of holds on. 
But as long as that body is guarded, it prevents the body from healing. So it's kind of like they can get that massage, they feel good for that day, and then boom, they feel bad again because that guard is up. So with acupuncture, you can let that guard down, which is really helpful. Then I would do points around the nerve and distal spots as well to draw that blood flow away to decrease inflammation. So acupuncture is one thing. We do cupping, we do electric stim, which sounds terrifying and it feels amazing. And it's like that deep tissue massage, but again, from the inside out. But again, at that, they'd have to keep coming. It's one of those things where... Well, it depends if they keep re-injuring it. So the goal in acupuncture, we're actually notoriously the worst practitioners for business because our goal is to never see you again, to actually fix the problem because the body's meant to heal. It's meant to be healthy. It shouldn't need to depend on a therapist in order to maintain health. It should get back into it. So with acupuncture, ideally treatments closer together at first, so we can start breaking that pattern that the body automatically adjusts to helps. And then we really space out the treatments to allow the body to become independent of acupuncture. So it's different when it comes to bodybuilders though, because you're always going to keep challenging your vulnerability. And as long as you keep challenging it, you might need some maintenance treatment in order to continue the quality of life that you want. So how often should a, a bodybuilder, weightlifter go in to see acupuncture? You know, is it something where you, we have to do this maybe once a week, once every two weeks? What is the ultimate um, recommendation? It depends on what they want to achieve. So ideally, what I like to do is everyone has a level of contentness that they want to be at. So if I can take away their migraines and I can help with their IBS and I can help with that lactic acid or aid in recovery, with acupuncture, it can allow you to recover so much quicker. So if you're doing a heavy duty, challenging segment of your workout, well then having acupuncture after to flush it and to make your recovery so much quicker is advantageous. If you're doing it just for maintenance, so you don't sprain your muscles or pull your muscles or create any cramping of your muscles, then you could come more as needed. Some people might need once a week, some people might need once a month. It depends on where you're at and how healthy your body is. So Rebecca, when, when I announced we we're going to do this podcast, I had quite a few listener DMs and quite a few people said, you know, Hey, I'm super excited that you're getting an acupuncturist on. I love acupuncture. And then we also had a lot of people say, I tried acupuncture. I noticed nothing from it whatsoever. Oh yeah. It kills me. So in, at least in Manitoba and actually in most places, there's no regulations with acupuncture. So Physios can do a two-weekend course, chiropractors could do some course, naturopaths could do some course, but they're not traditional Chinese medicine practitioners. So lots of people are willing to try acupuncture once. And if it doesn't work, they're like, ah, it's not for me. But it's kind of like tooth pain. If you go to a dentist because you have tooth pain and they don't fix it, do you just accept it or do you try someone different? And because people don't know that the quality of acupuncture is just completely variable, so are the quality of treatments. So you should be feeling something. It is exceptionally rare for someone to walk out after a few treatments and say, I have zero impact. It's so what I mean, Pardon? It's like the same problem we have as personal trainers, right? You can go to Good Life and there'll be a guy who did a weekend course mm -hmm. and there could be a personal trainer who's been personal training for 20 years, right? And same qualifications. So you really yeah. don't know. Is there yeah. any source you recommend? Like, is there maybe like an acupuncture governing body? Um, can an acupuncture get like tenure? Is there anything like that? So you know the person you're going to is certified and is, you know, going to be able to help you? you uh, because of the lack of regulations, you need to do your own research. So if it's um, dry needling, that's a two-weekend course, physio person. If it's traditional Chinese medicine acupuncture or TCM acupuncture, then you know that person went to school post-secondary at least three years and actually is going to treat your whole body and the actual true cause as opposed to just your underlying symptom. So an acupuncturist, maybe don't see, but a traditional Chinese medicine acupuncturist, that would be someone that you can have confidence on. I went to a guy uh, maybe a couple years ago, and he was like this young kid. He was like 20 years old. He was like this young Asian kid. Mm -hmm. All he did was stick a few needles in me, and it was just so weird because my it was my elbow, and like it did absolutely nothing for me. So I totally understand where our listeners are coming from. But again, like when I left there, I knew this kid doesn't know shit, and I was never going back to him again. So you really gotta it should be common sense to you, like when you go in there. If it's some twenty year old 
Asian kid, you know, his parents probably like bought him the, the rented him an office space or something and said, okay, go do acupuncture. So I mean, it's just a common sense guys. I mean, you should know when you walk in, like, is this person legit or not? It's kind of obvious. Or go and rate my MD and then check them out because you're going to see the good reviews. You're going to see the bad reviews and you're going to see who's legit. But mo like my entire business is strictly just word of mouth. So people, once you feel good, you talk and then they talk and then they talk and then you actually know who to go to, but you truly have to do your research before seeing an acupuncturist because you can get anyone doing it, which is really too bad. Well, on this subject, what are the economic costs of doing acupuncture? Because the United States, you know, our insurance doesn't cover it. I don't know about Canada. So what's an acupuncture? What's a fair price to go in to see an acupuncturist for the first time or follow-up appointments? What should we be looking for? Obviously, if they're going to charge you 500 bucks to come in, that's pretty, pretty much bullshit. I mean, what's, what's, a, what's a good, fair price that we should be looking for when we call? Well, I know each state is different and each province in Canada is different. So in Manitoba, we're kind of the budget province. So acupuncture is the cheapest, I'm pretty sure, in the country here. But I charge $100 for a consultation with an acupuncture treatment and $65 for all follow-up treatments. I think on average in the States, it's about 95 bucks a treatment-ish. But each practitioner is different. It's normally pretty similar to massage. Most massage places are going to go be like 65 to 100 and acupuncture is normally around there. Yeah, probably. Rebecca, we had a lot of listener questions on supplements. So, you know, if someone's suffering from inflammation, they'd probably take something like turmeric. If someone is suffering from liver toxicity, they may take milk thistle or tudka. What are your thoughts on these dietary supplements? Uh, some are great. Some might not be great. It depends on the body where the liver at least from a Chinese medicine perspective, it gets exhausted by having anything that's artificial. So adding something that if you live on pills and meal supplements, etc., having extra pills in your handful of pills may not do as many benefits as you think. But if you eat cleaner and then you add supplements, it can be really beneficial. So the milk thistle is awesome for the liver. Um, dandelion root would be really helpful too and some supplements are great it just depends on the person taking it are there any particular chinese herbs or supplements that you would recommend for weightlifters i know it's i know it's generally person specific but is there a couple like let's say ginseng is that one that you would generally recommend um, it is except for ginseng isn't necessarily good long term and there's three different kinds of ginseng whether it's american chinese or korean and they all do different things. So if you don't really know, you could be doing something that boosts your reproductive fertility and it's not necessarily helping your energy. <laughs> so it kind of depends on what you're getting for. But also it's not very good to take long term as well. So then your body can start getting used to that and then you go off of it and you're going to feel worse than when you started. Interesting. What, so what are some things that we're putting in our body? You know, whether it be like what we're breathing, what we're eating, what we're drinking, that everyone's is doing, but we shouldn't be doing. We should cut it out. Is there is there something that you can you can tell us that can help us get healthier? Hmm. Well, for me it's more it's more the common sense diet. People know it. So Chinese medicine is neat because we go we really butt heads with a lot of uh, holistic nutrition and diet therapists or dietitians because we like to eat strictly for the season so we change our diet based on our environment so in winter having like a shake with frozen fruits in there and handfuls of raw spinach isn't doing your body a favor as much as having oatmeal so it's it's different per season so it's more the common sense diet in the heart of winter eating a salad every day isn't as good for you as possibly eating a stir fry every day. And you're just like, yeah, well, that makes sense. Eating when you're rushed makes absolutely no sense because your body is in a fight or fight. It's not in that rest and digest. So the biggest thing that I see in clinic is digestion problems, A, due to supplements, or B, just due to lifestyle, where no one actually is sitting anymore and eating meals. Eating has become almost like an inconvenience. And that's, 
ridiculous because it's awesome and food is meant to taste good and we're supposed to enjoy it. So now people will take like a frozen shake first thing in the morning when their body is still in starvation mode, chug like three carrots, two bananas, a bunch of protein in three gulps and think that this is good for them. And you're just like, well, the body's in shock. It was just in starvation mode. How do you expect it to digest this and actually give you energy? It's going to go into shock and you're going to get more tired. So the main advice that I would give people is don't view food as an inconvenience. View it as a luxury. You know, when you sit and if you have this meal in front of you and you look at it, what's going to happen? You're going to start salivating. Everything comes there. And the majority of the digestive enzymes for carbohydrates is that amylase, right? Which is in your salivary glands. So you look at your meal, you start salivating, you start chewing it, and your body is doing the work just in your mouth, not even before it hit your digestive system. And then you're actually going to be in a rest and digest state where the blood will go to your gut and you're going to actually reap the benefits of it. You're going to have more energy, you're going to feel better, and food will actually serve its purpose. Where when people are on the computer or staring at their phone and they're eating and they don't even see what they're eating, the blood is going to the brain. It's not going to your gut. And you're going to get bloated. You're going to get IBS. You're going to be exhausted after. And it just, it just makes sense. I think so, this, that what you're describing is, is getting worse because, like, every kid, you ever seen, like, a family at a restaurant or something? And the kids, the, the, the mom and dad look miserable. And then the two kids are sitting there with their iPhone playing a video game on their phone while they're eating. And they're yeah. busy with their iPhone. There's no family, like, just talking with each other and enjoying each other's company. The kids have their heads into the phone and while they're eating. So what you just said is exactly what, what we see all the time. So I wonder in another 10, 20, 30 years, all those kids are going to grow up with major, major digestive problems, even worse than what we see today. It wouldn't surprise me, right? Well, it's truly getting worse by the minute. I mean, kids have digestion problems. Kids should not have digestion problems. They should have an awesome life, eat, and go play. But they do, and you got to question what's changed, and it's so obvious. They're eating in front of the TV, or they're staring at their phones, and they're not actually having a meal in a calm place. So even watching like a scary or a TV show or a drama, the blood is going to your brain again. It just... It's like that common sense, get back to the basics. And eating really doesn't take long. You can just look at this, whatever you're choosing to eat. It's like four minutes, four minutes of bliss. Just look at it, chew, swallow, be happy, have a conversation, and then get on with your day, which actually takes less time than trying to multitask. We should listen. We should watch our pets. Like my cat, when she eats, she, you know, just, she, she focuses on the food eats does does it she's done she walks away and goes takes a nap i mean we should we should just watch our pets to see how they eat it's it's that simple you know true, and they poop like champs so like those those dogs those cats who eat in bliss and then do something else they have great digestion and they actually eat food that's usually kind of worse than what we could eat but yeah it just goes back to the basics and that's what I like about Chinese medicine is it brings people back to the basics. If you said that to your great grandmother, she's like, of course, we sit at a meal, we eat. Everyone is fine. We're all healthy. No one needs to take a nap after a meal unless your meal is too big. I so really think you're onto something, Rebecca, because Pardon? I really think you're onto something because if you were to ask your grandparents, the kids have food allergies, there might've been one kid in the entire school that had like a peanut allergy, right? Like it wasn't very common. Now, most schools won't even let kids pack peanuts in their lunch because there's so many allergies that just the fumes might cause an allergic reaction. And I yeah. mean, it, it's getting ridiculous. It's like, I mean, there's kids at my church who have like 19 different food allergies. They, they can't have peanuts, they can't have shellfish, they can't have wheat, they can't have dairy. It's like, holy crap, this kid's like six. What can the six-year-old so eat besides like white rice and fish like i feel horrible for these kids yeah but when you think about it how unhealthy parents are creating unhealthy kids and now our food quality has become so poor the kids are now becoming born with allergies to it so you look at peanuts for example example they're like the most densely chemical ridden 
food that there is there. So now the body is saying, no, we can't handle this anymore. We can't have it. So now it's just saying instant, no, you go to Asian cultures, no one has a peanut allergy. They just eat natural peanuts. No one has it. And you go to ours and half the kids have it. And I think it's a lot of the quality of it, like, like lactose or dairy. No one throughout history has had dairy allergies. But now when we pasteurize milk and homogenize it, and these cows aren't healthy and they're not happy, and we're having the essence, we're having the milk of unhealthy beans, of course we're going to start reacting to it. It just, again, it just makes sense. Rebecca, we're close to our hour here. One thing I want you to talk a little bit more about is eating seasonal. This is something that really interests me. What are certain foods we should be eating on the certain seasons, and then what are certain foods we should avoid? So when you think about spring, spring is like new beginnings. There are these little seedlings that are just coming out. Us Winnipeggers are coming out of hibernation. We're really vulnerable. That's when people get a lot of sickness. They feel just off. So you want to eat foods that are like almost seedlings, like having more alpha alpha sprouts. Start introducing some of those light greens into your diet. Make a big difference. In summer, that's the free time. That's when you get to have the pineapple and the watermelon and fresh food because no one's craving stew in summer. They're craving refreshing light foods. So that is a time that you just get to have all bars down, enjoy your food. Fall is a time where it's kind of like you eat in your garden. It's really lush in the summer, so you want to have those tomatoes, etc. In fall time, you want to have these root vegetables. Those are the things that are really in season. You want to have those squash. You want to have those pumpkins. Um, have more soups and stews. And winter is hibernation time. This is the time that you really want to go deep and nourish yourself for a really dark, cold season. So you'll see these people who are eating salads just because they think it's healthy. And then they're staring at that person's like slow-cooked cold pork or stew with just envy. And because you want to eat those soups, these stews, these slow cooked food, you want to eat foods that are just so comforting and warm and savory. So winter is more rich foods, summer is more light foods, and fall and spring is the transition, yes. So does it depend where you live? Yes, so if you live in California, you're eternal summer. So that's why people can have those raw food diets. Where if we have, if a Winnipegger picked up a California based food diet, we would all have like bloated stomachs all the time. But is it, ba is it based on where you're living? Like right. if Trevor moved to California, he instantly changes diet, or is it based on where your ancestors are from? Well, a little bit of both. So everybody thrives differently. You know, some bodies love fish and veggies, other ones need red meat. So there is a different body type for how we eat. But no, if Trevor moved to California, he's not going to be craving stews. You know, he's Trevor's <laughs> African, so he would eat, he would be eating fruit all the time. <laughs> so basically, if you live in a hot climate, you're going to eat lighter, refreshing raw foods. If you live in a colder climate, you're going to eat more nourishing foods because no covers veggies for a reason. You got to eat the stuff that you could prepare. Becca, this is really fascinating. I think part of the problem we have right now with our Instagram society is that it's, this is the program, it should fit everyone. And one thing I've really been experimenting with as a coach with my clients is that you have to make sure the workout program matches your phenotype. So there's certain people like me who are very task oriented. When I go to the gym, I wanna know what exercises I'm doing, which order I'm doing the exercises, how many reps I want to be getting. I like lists. I like order. I like structure. There's other people, usually women, where if I gave them a workout like this, they'd be like, this is freaking boring. I do not want to do this. This is the most boring thing you ever gave me. They like doing different exercises every time. They like doing things like see how many push-ups you can get in a minute. They like excitement. They don't like structure. They like doing something different every time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really like about this is that if I'm following Joe Fitness 66 on Instagram and he lives in Florida and he's posting, you know, these raw fruit diets and it's the middle of January here in Winnipeg, I'm going to look at that and be like, Hey, I want to look like him. I'm going to follow that. I'm going to go to Costco and buy some pineapple that's imported from Mexico and start juicing it. Yep. 
And then you're just like, why am I not getting the same results? This is terrible. I'm exhausted. I'm bloated. Why is this not working for me like it's working with, for him? Exactly. It's based on so many factors in your life. And you don't live the same life as that guy. Well, what most people do is they follow that guy. They don't get the same results. And they're like, well, this is crap. I'm going to take a bunch of steroids. Yep. <laughs> that sounds about right. Interesting. So how, so how often do you do acupuncture, Rebecca? On myself? Yeah. <laughs> do you do it on yourself? Yeah. Or you get someone. I my kids this morning, too. They love it. So you do it on yourself. You don't have like a partner or something to do it to you. No, I just do it on myself and I just hope I don't have back issues and then I'm set. Okay, but so any you point that you could do on the front, you could do on the back too. So how but often I'll, do you do it on hmm? yourself? How often do you do it to yourself? I'll do it every couple of weeks. So, or particularly if I feel a cold or flu coming on, then I'll give myself a treatment instantly because with acupuncture, you can just stop it instantly. And I have no time for that. So, so those of us like, because a lot of us, you know, we pin ourselves, you know, we're like, uh, you know, you know how it goes. Should we go online and buy, buy our own needles and start pinning oh, them? Or should we go see a professional? I so really I'm gonna pin Trevor with like 20 needles in his freaking face sometimes. Sure. Crazy. Is that safe? Well, well, point selection is key. So if you don't understand Chinese theory, you're just poking yourself. And that's kind of comical. So ideally, you want to go to an acupuncturist because they're probably treating you for more things than you're even knowing. And then the act of relaxing, like when I treat myself, I'm just busy, so I don't have as much time in my life to have those scheduled appointments because I'm working all the time. But uh, to actually relax and let go and have that forced 20 minutes to yourself without a phone, without anything that you can accomplish besides just being within is really therapeutic in and of itself. And poking yourself feels terrible, so. Rebecca, we're at an hour here. I want you to finish off the show. Talk to us a little bit about your kids. You have two young kids. Yes. What are some tips you can give parents? Because the number one thing I the number one thing I hear parents say is that, well, they're kids. They should eat craft dinner. They should eat fried chicken nuggets. That's what kids eat. What are, what are some suggestions for, for the parents listening? I think parents should just change their mindset about what is healthy. So if you're giving kids craft dinner, they'd actually be better off not eating at all than eating the craft dinner because it makes their body less healthy. So my kids think that snap peas are candy. And I will like put the middle part out and I open it up and they get to eat the little babies and I tell them it's candy and they believe it. You know, when there's popsicles, I'll blend watermelon and freeze it and they think they're the best popsicles ever. So kids don't understand what is healthy and what is not. It's, it's up to the parents to let them know what is good and bad. And if the parents love it, the kids are probably going to try it. Well, we just came off Halloween. So what did you do for Halloween? Uh, what's an idea? Of what to do there? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't give any candy to kids. I was a Grinch this Halloween. <laughs> I, because uh, there's not that many kids where I live, so um, I do I do love kids, but I just I just don't have any where I live. But like if next year when when I do Halloween and they kids come, what should I be giving them that's healthy? What's an idea that they won't take my house after? Well, give them crayons. <laughs> Try to give them other food because you can't give them health food because parents are just going to throw it out because they don't trust strangers. So ironically, parents view health food as something that is so packaged and preserved because that's safer for their kids. So Halloween, you really can't win. Being a Grinch actually is doing them more favors than giving them chocolate. But uh, I was gonna make them gruel. <laughs> but then I was scared they would egg my house. Yeah, they probably would. And I don't think they would trust the random person to eat their gruel. So <laughs> better not to do that. But I just view it as let the kids know what is healthy. So my kids, when they have a choice, they actually choose healthy food over non-healthy food because A, it makes me happy. They see my excited reward and they feel better. So when all their friends are sick and they're the only healthy kids in their class, I tell them it's because you eat your vegetables. This makes you strong. So it's not necessarily just protein makes you strong. Health makes you strong. So when I change that mindset, they love eating fruits and vegetables, and they truly love it. So because every kid, if you give them the option, even a kid who is impoverished and only gets junk food, you give them healthy food, they're probably going to enjoy it. Because we know, our bodies know it's good for us. You feel better after. 
So I think the parents just got to step up their game and teach the kids about what is good for them and what's fun to eat. I put little raspberries on the fingertips and they pretend to be monsters. They think it's hilarious. But you just make it fun. Rebecca, you're really leading by example. I really appreciate you doing this podcast because you're working five days a week. You have two kids. I mean, you're really doing everything. Where can our listeners find out more about your clinic if they are located in Winnipeg and want to come for a treatment? Uh, our website, familyacupuncturewellness.com, has a lot of information. I have an Instagram page. It's Family Acupuncture Wellness. And I have a Facebook page. You can get it at Winnipeg Acupuncture. I have all of those in the show notes. Are you active on your Instagram? Are you constantly posting stuff? Yeah, enough. Forcing my balance as well. I got to kind of practice what I preach. But yes, I love Instagram, love Facebook. It's tough because these are like some of the things you, you talked about on this podcast. They're very, very good things for a lot of people to know. You should be posting more because this is stuff that no one's talking about. And it's, it's kind of common sense stuff when you really think of it. But if someone doesn't tell you it, you'll overthink it. Agreed, because we're not taught to really think about it. Perfect. Rebecca, I really appreciate you coming on the show. For our listeners, I will have all of her social media links and the website in the show notes, so you guys can check that out. For your host, Trevor Karitson, for my co-host, Steve Smee, and for our special guest, Rebecca Sprints of Family Wellness Acupuncture Clinic in Winnipeg. Family so, Acupuncture Wellness. Almost family perfect. Family Acupuncture, Acupuncture Wellness Clinic. Clinic in Winnipeg, Manitoba another episode of Evolutionary Radio. Live your life, look and doing it. Thanks for listening.